Hello, everyone. It's Elise Murphy from Level Financial Advisors, a financial advisor and partner here at Level. Today, we're going to be reviewing the Secure Act 2.0 legislation. This was originally passed at the end of 2022, but a lot of measures in the legislation were scheduled out to be implemented over the next several years. So we thought it would be nice to kind of dive back in, do a reminder of some of those things that are up and coming. And I hope you had your coffee today because a lot of these rules can be a little bit uh, uh, dry and very uh, sort of confusing, some of them especially. So without further ado, we're going to get right into it. On the agenda today, we're going to talk about a lot of changes that apply to those in retirement or very close to retirement, and then just a few changes for the next generation towards their retirement. So some of the biggest changes uh, to required minimum distributions or your RMDs are that Currently, an individual doesn't have to start taking them until age 73. It uh, used to be that you had to take required minimum distribution starting at 70 and a half. And slowly over the past couple of years, we've seen that that requirement, required minimum distribution age has continued to increase. For anyone who is already taking required minimum distributions, this does not affect you because you must continue taking them on that schedule. And one interesting piece about Roth IRA accounts and Roth contributions, previously, if you had Roth contributions in say a 401k plan, you were required to still make RMDs from that account, even though the whole benefit of one of the benefits of a Roth is to not have required minimum required minimum distribution. So this legislation really changed that around to say, hey, even if you have Roth funds in some of these 401k, 403b, 457 types accounts, you won't be subject to a required minimum distribution on those Roth monies inside those types of qualified retirement accounts. A big one that makes us really happy to hear is that penalties for not taking your required minimum distribution or going to reduce. Previously, before Secure Act 2.0, there was a very hefty penalty of 50% if you failed to take your required minimum distribution. Now, that is a pretty big penalty. And I think they started to kind of say, hey, you know, maybe we should reduce that. And this act did reduce that to 25%. However, the penalty can reduce even further down to 10% if you correct the required minimum distribution in a timely manner. So if you forgot to take that required minimum distribution for 2024, but you realized it in 2025, if you got those funds out, your penalty would be reduced down to 10%. And even you could still kind of plead your case to the IRS and say, hey, you know, I had these other circumstances going on. This is why I may have, you know, been neglectful in taking my RMD and, you know, plead your case to them and see what they say. Uh, another thing, too, on, you know, sort of uh, auditing and of, of tax returns and other tax issues kind of comes into where you get the statute of limitations to say if you missed an RMD, you know, how far back will they look? And they set this at three years and previously it was indefinite. So that is a nice change as well. Changes in catch up contributions. So Every year for your various types of qualified retirement plans, whether it's IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, and the like, you always have your base contribution that you're allowed to make, and you have a catch-up. It's an additional amount that you are able to put in if you're over the age of 50, 
to help catch you up if you're a little bit behind in retirement savings so you can add more money into the plan. The catch-up contribution limit in 2024 is about $7,500. And starting in January of 2025, individuals ages 60 to 63 years old will be able to make up cat make catch up contributions of up to $10,000 annually to their workplace retirement plans. And that will be indexed for inflation. Now, this is one of those pieces where I see and say, and sometimes I get questions, well, why did they pick 60 to 63? Uh, you know, I have no idea, you know, why that particular age limit was set over others. But it's one of those rules that a lot of people, because there's some nuance there, might easily be caught up in. So we're helping to monitor that for all of our clients to make sure that they're uh, adhering to those rules and taking advantage of that extra catch-up contribution if you're between those ages. Another interesting change is that beginning in 2026, so this hasn't quite happened yet, but it's good to keep it out on the forefront because if you earn more than $145,000 indexed for inflation, your, all of your catch-up contributions are actually specifically going to need to be made to the Roth after-tax portion of your retirement accounts instead of the pre-tax portion of your retirement accounts. And so that's, again, one of those rules where, you know, we hope our, our sort of software and our programming catches up to help us uh, find that so we don't accidentally put money into pre-tax contributions if we're over that $145,000. So hopefully technology will help us, you know, in our various retirement savings plans there. But you never know don't know which systems will talk to each other and how some of these systems would know, you know, how much you're earning. So we want to make sure that no one gets tripped up on that rule when it comes down the line and it is implemented in 2026. And right now, you know, like I was mentioning earlier, you have your base contribution you can make to an IRA and then you have the catch up. That catch-up was always $1,000 uh, for the longest time, while the base amount you were allowed to put in an IRA or Roth IRA slowly increased from year to year, and the IRS would announce the new amounts for the next year so you could start planning and making your contributions accordingly. Well, starting in 2024, they are allowing this to actually increase with inflation in increments of $100. So we'll actually see maybe years in the future, possibly where your catch-up could be, you know, $1,500 or $1,600 or, you know, other amounts. So you can have that opportunity to get that extra money into your retirement accounts. But again, maybe a little bit hard to keep track of. Uh, it's great that it increases with inflation because inflation has an impact over time, but want to make sure that we're remembering some of these nuances in these rules. Changes to contributions and, you know, some of the ways you're able to make contributions to your retirement accounts. Uh, previously, if you had a 401k, only you could put in after-tax Roth contributions to your 401k. Your employer would not have been allowed to make Roth contributions. All of their contributions to the account would have had to have been pre-tax. So with this new change, employers will be able to add their non-elective or matching contributions to the Roth portion which is, a, is great for added flexibility. Next, for those of our um, clients that have 401k plans, specifically the solo 401k plans, uh, solo 401k plans are for those who are um, sole proprietors. You are now permitted to make deferrals for the previous calendar year until the date that you as an individual file your tax return. 
that is very helpful because sometimes our solo practitioners are waiting for certain numbers to come in and become clear upon going through the process of filing the tax return. And so they can look back and make an appropriate contribution for them. So this is, this is great news for our solo practitioners. Also in 2027, so again, this is not effective yet, the saver's credit will be replaced with the saver's match. So previously, anybody who was in was within certain income thresholds was able to take a deduction on their tax return if they were saving to their retirement accounts. This whole system has been replaced with the savers match by saying, hey, you know, instead of giving you a credit on your taxes due, maybe it would be more beneficial from a standpoint of your retirement and the amount you're accumulating in your retirement savings to actually just be able to put a match into that account for you rather than that credit. So that savers match is gonna be 50% up to the first $2,000 contributed by an individual to an IRA. Again, that's one of those things I think they set the date out for later because this will take time to get some of the systems in place that they need to actually make this happen. Changes to distributions. So a lot of our clients are familiar with QCDs or Qualified Charitable Distributions, a very popular strategy, especially now that many clients are taking the standard deduction versus itemized deductions on their returns. One of the things that you're now able to do with the QCD is give a one-time gift of $50,000 to charitable remainder trusts, annuity trusts, or charitable gift annuity. Now, some of those plans are a little less common that we see clients use, but is still an option for those who are looking for ways to give to charity through their retirement accounts and also make sure they're doing it in the most tax efficient way possible. Previously, the amount that you could distribute from your IRA to a charity was $100,000, and that was sort of a fixed $100,000 dollar maximum that you could donate to a charity directly. They have decided to increase this as well, and the limit will be set to $105,000 for 2024, and this will also increase with inflation. And starting in 2026, a very interesting strategy is going to be able to be used in that, you know, a lot of plans you know, before never really gave you any sort of way to pay for qualified long-term care insurance. Uh, some, some clients get a deduction on their state tax return for having a long-term care policy. And I think they were looking for ways to make it easier for the average person to pay for these long-term care policies because some of them can get quite pricey. So they created this qualified long-term care distribution that will allow you to take the lesser of 10% of the account balance or $2,500 per year to help pay for that long-term care insurance policy. And you're not going to get any sort of penalties to do so if you were under the age of 59 and a half and would have normally faced a penalty if you were going to take money out of your qualified retirement plan to pay for your long-term care insurance. Next uh, is another change for simple IRAs and SEP IRAs. Previously, only plans could be funded with pre-tax dollars. And starting already, this is, this is active now, you have the ability to put after-tax dollars in your simple IRA or SEP IRA. So that can provide, again, more flexibility depending on your overall tax strategy that you and your advisor at level are working on to say, 
what is more appropriate for me? Should I be making pre-tax contributions, post-tax, or maybe even blend of both? This is great because now we have these, this flexibility inside some of these account types that we previously didn't have them before with the simple IRA and the SEP IRA. Changes to beneficiary options. So it's now uh, you know, quite the endeavor to figure out what options you have if you are the beneficiary of a retirement account or IRA. There's lots of different options depending on if you're an eligible beneficiary or a non-eligible designated beneficiary. This just gave you one more option if you were a surviving spouse. Now you're eligible to be able to be treated as if you were the decedent. And this all just to say and make it maybe a little simpler, if you were older than the person, your spouse who passed away, this new rule might be to your advantage because you could delay taking required minimum distributions for a longer period of time. So it just gives another option to say, how am I eligible to sort of receive this account and what required minimum distribution rules will I fall under once that account is in my name? This just gives you another option if it was your spouse who passed away. So very interesting for the next generation uh, of, of retirement savers, beginning in 2024, unused funds in 529 plans are allowed to be rolled over to a Roth IRA. There are several important caveats to this. We have to make sure that the rollover is taking place in, an, uh, in a 529 plan that's been open for 15 years. The plan assets that you roll over into the Roth IRA have a lifetime limit of $35,000. So you won't be able to put in any amount beyond that to roll over those funds from the 529 plan to the Roth. Another thing that, you know, is a nuance there, they really want to make sure these 529 contributions have been in the plan for a long time. And so they want to make sure any contributions that have been made very recently are ineligible to be moved. So if contributions are made in the last five years and those earnings on those contributions those are not eligible to be moved to that Roth IRA. And of course, one of the things that you still have to adhere to is what the annual contribution limit is for the Roth IRA in that year. So for example, if you had someone who was able to do this today and they had $35,000 of unused 529 plan funds, you couldn't roll over all $35,000 in funds right now today. You would still have to adhere to the 2024 Roth IRA contribution limit of $7,000, for example. And there's going to be no income limits on these rollovers. Uh, you know, sometimes you can actually make too much money to be able to put funds into a Roth IRA. But here, uh, this is not going to be a concern because they put no income limits on it. Another big caveat here that you would really need to make sure you watch out for is depending on what state you live in, especially in New York State, New York State has sort of not decided to match what the federal government is allowing with some of these 529 uh, allowances they've made over the past couple years. And in New York State, you do get a tax deduction on your state tax return when you put funds into a 529 plan. And a lot of times New York State is saying, well, the federal government said you were allowed to do that, uh, but New York State didn't say you were allowed to do that. And so if you do a move like this, 
you may be subject to a New York State recapture of the tax credit that they originally provided you when you made the contribution to that account. So more on that, it will be interesting to see, um, you know, if, if New York State will ever change that, but that's something we absolutely need to be aware of and check to make sure that you know, the state, what the state allows you to do and what the federal government allows you to do are in step with one another or are, are they not in sync? And we really have to be aware of the different rules that might apply. So there is a lot there, uh, a lot of different rules to be aware of, a lot of nuances, a lot of different dollar amounts and years to remember. So it could be uh, pretty complex in the implementation of a lot of this. So we have some additional resources for you as well to uh, help you kind of navigate some of these big changes. And always, you know, give us a call and reach out to us and, you know, we'll help walk you through all the, all these different pieces and how, you know, they work in your personal financial plan that we put together. So thank you for joining me for the Secure Act 2.0 update.